All right. Thank you all for welcoming me here so kindly. It really is such an honor to be here. Um, Backstory, about three years ago, I was on the street in London, of all places, and um, someone came up to me and she said, have you heard about this festival that goes on in Norway with the Lutheran Church? I said, I have not. She said, you have to come. It would be so cool. And I said, hey, if you invite me, I'm coming. And so fast forward three years later, got the invite. Here I am. Uh, So I'm excited. Thank you for the invitation. I'm pumped. So y'all got to know me just a little bit, just a little bit ago. Now, I want to ask you a question. If I were to say, all right, guys, look, I don't know any of y'all. I don't know you guys. Like, this is the first time I'm meeting you, so let's get to know each other. And what if I had each of you individually come up here on stage with a mic, and you have to tell everybody who you are? Would you be a little nervous? No. Yeah, that, you, can, you can answer that. He said, no, he's lying. Y'all, you ain't supposed to lie in the church. So we got some other problems we need to talk about. You'd be nervous. You'd be nervous if you had to come up here and you had to tell everybody who you are. And to be honest, even if you didn't have to come up here and you didn't have to have a microphone and tell everyone, even just thinking about who you are might cause some anxiety. Because identity is a really hard topic to talk about. Many of you sitting here are ages, what, 15 to 20 something? In that time of our life, sometimes it gets really confusing who we are. The world's shaping us as to who we are. We're doing all these different things. We haven't established a job yet. We don't necessarily know fully who we are. We're not married yet, you know. So, so who are we, right? And we're trying to answer these big questions. Like I said, when I was 17, I had done Dancing with the Stars. I had done several other things. But I was still asking myself the question of who am I? Like what am I trying to do, you know? And so one day I was on Instagram and I was kind of just wondering what other people would say if I asked them the question, who, who are you? So I asked the question on my Instagram, on my story, what do you identify with? And it was so interesting. I got like thousands of different answers, literally. Thousands of different answers. Some people said I identify with the way that I look. Some people said I identify with my grades in school. Some people say I identify with the school that I go to. Some people said my identity is wrapped around my relationship status. Some people said I identify with the gender that I am, with the sexuality I'm attracted to. People said I identify with the job that I have, with the race that I am. A lot of people said I identify as what other people say about me. Some people say I identify with my popularity or my lack of popularity. People sometimes said I identify with my disability or something I did in my past. And then I had a lot of people say this is the answer. And some of you might be thinking, oh, I know the answer to this question. I know what she's looking for. I know exactly what I would say if I had a microphone because I know everybody would clap if I said my identity is in who God says that I am. All right, yeah, exactly, we would clap for that. And for that, I would be like, yes, that's awesome. I love that you identify with that. I love that you would say, I am who he says I am. Maybe you sing that song here, the Hill song, I am who he says I am. We identify with who God says that we are, and that is incredible. But what I would ask you to follow up with that is, has that actually changed who you are? Because we can say it all day long, but until it changes who we are, it doesn't really matter. You see, because there was a time in my life when I was about your age where I could tell you so many things about who God says that I am. I could tell you that I haven't been given a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind, but yet I was still afraid of everything and super anxious. I could tell you that I was made altogether beautiful and wonderful, that God says there is no flaw in me, that I am made in his image, but at the end of the day, I was still insecure. I'm not confident in who I am. So I could say all these things about who God says that I am, but at the end of the day, it didn't change who I am. Because honestly, if God is not God to you, then what God says about you won't change who you are. If God is not on the throne of your life, if he's not the priority of your life, then what he says about you isn't gonna hold much value in your life. You see, if your relationship status is number one, then that's going to hold the value. 
if your looks are number one, if your status, if your popularity, if that's more important to you, then that's going to shape who you are. But if God is God, if God really is the creator of the universe, and if he really is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and if he really did send his son to die for you, if he really is God, and you believe that he is God and you understand you are his child, that will change everything about the way that you live. Period. You will be confident. You will have peace. You will have joy. You will feel loved. You will feel all these things because it will become true. So the question tonight that I want to answer is I don't want to answer the question of who are you. I want you to answer the question of who is God to you. In Matthew chapter 16, it's really interesting because Jesus actually straight up asked this question. Basically, he takes his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And in Caesarea Philippi, the backstory of this place in the Bible is this place was literally called the gates of hell. So Jesus decides to take his disciples to the gates of hell, this terrible part of where they were from. And the reason why it was called the gates of hell is because this was the central gathering place of false worship. Well, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be the central gathering place of false worship? Well, basically in this place, there was so many gods that these people bowed down to. If you would go to Caesarea Philippi, you would see this temple and that temple and this temple and this temple, and they were all to serve other gods. So you would see the god of Pan, which is a very lustful god. You would see a fertility god for people who wanted to get pregnant. You would literally see, no joke, dancing goats that people would go and bow to and worship. You would see Caesar would have a palace that you could worship Caesar in. All these other gods. And Jesus took his disciples straight to this place, comparing himself to all of these other gods and asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And let's listen to how this plays out. Verse 13 of chapter 16 says this, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? So he starts it by saying, who do other people say that I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You see, tonight I'm not asking you what other people say about God. I'm not asking you what your best friend thinks about God. I'm not asking you what the country of Norway thinks about God. What I'm asking you is what Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that God is? And Simon Peter replied this, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now you have to realize, this is before Jesus took the cross. This is before he raised. This is just personal relationship right here with Jesus. And Peter recognizes who Jesus is. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And then Jesus said this to Peter. This is so cool. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, this place we're at, the gates of hell, it shall not prevail past what we are going to do. Y'all, that is a huge, huge portion of Scripture. Because right here in this moment, not only did Peter recognize who Jesus was. He said, you are God. You're the son of the living God. You are Lord to me. But right when Peter recognized who Jesus was, notice that Jesus then told Peter who he was. Then Jesus said, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. So not only did Peter right there receive his identity, but he also received his purpose after first recognizing that Jesus is God. You see, what happens when we recognize who our Father is, is we start to understand who we are, and we start to understand what we are called to do. When God becomes God to you, and this book becomes true to you, you have your identity and you have your purpose, you have your mission, you have a guide in this crazy life. You see, but what we're trying to do as culture, and especially as teenagers, is we want the world to tell us who we are. We want social media to tell us who we are. We're being shaped by social media and shaped by the voices of the world and shaped by culture. And then we try to come to conferences like this and also find our purpose in God and somehow make sense of these things and how do I have this and have this. But what culture says about you and what God says about you are normally gonna do this, boom. 
They don't collide. They're in direct opposition of each other. Because culture and what it tells you is awesome and great and amazing and this is how you identify with and this is what you're going to be if you're going to be successful and cool and all that stuff is completely opposite of what God says about you is true. Like I said earlier, there is a path that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. But there is a path of life and it is the way of Jesus Christ that leads to truth. That's Jesus. That's who God is. And so we can't try to find ourselves in culture and live a full life for Christ because it's always going to be less than what you're called to do and less than who you are. It will always fall up short. It cannot give you all that you are. Some of you are sitting in here and you're not as anxious about your identity. You're like, oh, no, I'm not really anxious about it. I'm just confused by it because I'm sitting in here and I want to be found in Christ. Everything I've heard the past few days, it's awesome. It sounds good. I want to stand up. I want to raise my hand. I want to say yes. I want that to be true. But the reality is, is I also identify with all these other things in the world. I also kind of want to live this life. I'm young. I have my whole life to live. Like, why can't I also do what culture says? Why can't I also live that way? All these worldly desires I have are very real and very true too. It's kind of like what Paul said. He said, I'm doing what I don't want to do, and I'm not doing what I want to do. There's this conflicted spirit within him. Why Why is this true? Well, I want to tell you something, that just because something is biblical, and just because you're made in the image of God— Just because it's biblical doesn't mean it's always going to feel natural. And that's something that you need to realize. One time I was at um, a friend of mine's rehearsal dinner. And a rehearsal dinner is just the night before someone gets married. And the night before someone gets married, a lot of times in our culture, you have this big dinner and everyone in the family gives speeches and they kind of bless the marriage and, you know, say how much that person means to them and all these things. And this mom was speaking at it. And you know how moms can be about weddings. I don't know if it's like this here, but in America, they are very boohoo okay? Get a little emotional. My baby's getting married. It's a whole thing. So the night before this wedding, she's all emotional. And she says something so profound in her state of emotion. She says, son, that was her son getting married. She says, son, although nothing about this feels natural, it is extremely biblical. And because this is biblical, it's literally in the Bible, I get to sit here tonight and rejoice that you are getting married. And I love how she said it. This doesn't feel natural to give you away. It's emotional. It's hard. But because it's biblical, I will rejoice. There's a lot of things that are biblical that are not natural. You see, it is biblical that if someone slaps us across the face, we're supposed to turn the other cheek. Now, that does not feel natural. If someone slaps you across the face, you're like... No, but you're called to turn the other cheek. You see, it might feel natural to you to not want to go the extra mile with someone. But Jesus says, man, if a brother asks you to go a mile, go with him another. You see, it is not natural for me to want to forgive someone who's hurt me. What's natural for me is to want to get mad and want to get angry and bitter and say, I'm never talking to this person again. But Jesus says to forgive someone not just once, but 70 times, seven times. You see, it might not feel natural for me to resist sexual immorality. Those sexual temptations and the desires that you have in your heart, those might feel legitimate, that might feel natural, but it is biblical that you flee from those things because God has a perfect plan within marriage. You see, it does not feel natural sometimes to even wanna live. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, what is my life? Do I even have meaning? Do I even have purpose? What am I even doing? But it is biblical that your life has meaning and your life has purpose and God knit you together in your mother's womb and has plans that are good for you, not to harm you, plans for hope and a future. That is biblical, that is true. And so although it doesn't feel natural because it is biblical, that's what I'm gonna stand on. That's the truth of what God says. You see, the problem is, and where things get hairy, is we have a culture that wants all truth to be truth. Truth is relative. Well, that's your truth, but my truth is I can do whatever I want. What is truth, right? But I'm going to tell you something that is going to sound so obvious, but I think we needed to be reminded of it. The thing that makes the truth powerful is that it is true. I mean, that's true, right? The thing that makes the truth have any meaning, and have any power, is that it is true. So just because culture wants everything to be true, doesn't mean everything is true. 
There's a verse in scripture, and it says this. It says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus says that. Jesus says that because he knows that he actually has the power to set us free, right? Well, I was on Google one day, and I was trying to Google where in the Bible did Jesus say, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I'm Googling this to find the verse reference. And this article pops up, and it says, who said you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free? So I click on the article, assuming it's going to be Jesus. Wrong. Click on the article. There's thousands of different accounts of all these different people that said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Probably more like hundreds, not thousands. But there's like this person who said it in the 1900s, and this person who said it in the 1800s during this movement, and this person who said it on Oprah, and all these different things. Of, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, when I'm reading that, something hits me. That is not true. That is not true for anyone else to say that, quote, except for Jesus. Why? Because when Jesus said it, he knew that him in and of himself being the way, the truth, and the life actually has the power to set you free from the bondage of sin and death. He actually has the power to break shame off of you. His truth actually has the power to stop you from being so afraid in your life. His truth actually has the power to break depression off of you. His truth actually has the power to give you identity and give you purpose. His truth literally takes away the sting of death. Can any other truth do that? No. It can't be true that any other truth can truly set you free but the blood of Jesus. See, a lot of us and a lot of what culture would tell you is that you don't need God. You don't need that truth. You can be your own truth. You can be your own God. You can be your own power. You can be your own love. Why would you need God for any of this, right? And it's the same lie that culture is telling us that literally told Eve this in the garden in Genesis 1. If you remember, Adam and Eve are in the garden and the serpent comes to Eve and tries to tell her if she takes a bite of this apple, then her eyes will be open and she will know good and evil and she will be like God. You see, Eve did not eat that apple that day because that apple just looked like such a good apple. I mean, have you ever seen an apple look that good that you would be willing to lose your whole life because you just got to take a bite? Never. They will never look that good. I don't care how red. I don't even care if you add peanut butter. It would never be that good to sacrifice that much. Eve did not take a bite of the apple because she thought the apple looked good. Eve took a bite of the apple because she thought, if I eat this apple, then I will be like God. And when she ate that apple, guess what she realized? She's not God. She can't be God. Because it's tempting to want to have the glory of God, but when you realize that to carry the weight of his glory, you have to carry the weight of your sin, all of a sudden it's not tempting anymore. Because the weight of glory seems really interesting, but the weight of sin is really scary. The good seems really great, but the and evil is what really stings. And see, to be your own God, you don't only get to carry yourself on the mountaintops, you got to survive in the valley. So maybe your life will be manageable to be God. Maybe you'll live an okay life. Maybe bad things won't happen to you. And maybe you can get by for some time trying to be your own God. But what do you do when you face death? Then can you be your own God? Then does your truth set you free? See, that's the seriousness of this, friends. We can say we're young all day long, we can say all these things, but the earlier we get this truth, the earlier we get to be the fullness of who we're called to be and who we're created to be. The earlier we get to be the light of the world, the earlier we get to share in the victory of Christ. You see what the word says? It's the same spirit that literally raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Is that not crazy to think about? Like that becomes true when this is true to you. When God is God to you, the same spirit that raised Jesus out of the grave is alive in you. When this becomes true to you, you become the light of the world. When you wake up to the reality that you are not God, but you are made in the image of God, and you are a child of God, and you let that be enough for you, you're going to live a very, very full life. And guess what? It doesn't just change your life. It changes everyone's life around you when you realize that. It doesn't just change your life, it changes your country's life. 
It doesn't just change your country's life, it changes the world. You see, because when Peter realized thousands of years ago that Jesus is God, and then Jesus told Peter that he is Peter, and he, Peter literally means rock, and he said, and on this rock, so on you, Peter, I'm going to build my church that the gates of hell will not prevail past. And then when Jesus died, was resurrected, sent Peter on a mission, do you realize Peter started the church? And now 2,000 years later, I am in Norway talking about the church. Do you realize how crazy that is? I'm telling y'all what Peter realized that day 2,000 years ago. I came 28 hours with a one-year-old to tell you what Peter realized that day. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you get a revelation of who your God is, when you realize you're that person, that's your identity, that's your purpose, the world changes, period. It's not too big of a thought to think that that is what happens. That is what happens. That's what happens when you realize it. So we got to get out done with our insecurity. We got to get done with our, we got to realize that we are God's child. Moses had this revelation. God showed up to Moses in a burning bush, called him by name, Moses, Moses. Moses is like, here I am. Now realize something, Moses was hiding at this time because he had just murdered someone, okay? Bad things were happening. So if you think your life is bad, consider that, okay? Moses was hiding because he killed a man. Moses had all kinds of identity issues. He was adopted. He didn't know his family at the time. He was grown up in a house that wasn't his. All kinds of stuff happening. And God shows up to Moses, and God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and to lead an entire generation out of slavery. Whoa, that's a big call. Go back to where you don't want to go and lead an entire generation out of slavery. And Moses asked the same question that many of you would probably ask God, who am I? Who am I that I could do that? And you know what God said in response to Moses? He didn't sit there and tell Moses how awesome he is. He didn't say, Moses, you are incredible. Do you not know who you are? You are this and you are that and you are awesome and that's why I am here. No, he did not say that. You know what God said? God said, I am who I am. And when people ask you who sent you here, you just say, I am who I am. See, that's why I said tonight, we don't need to answer the question, who am I? You need to answer the question, who is God? Who is God? Has anybody in here seen The Lion King, the movie? Okay, so y'all will get this. The Lion King basically shows you a picture of exactly what I'm trying to say. So Simba, he thinks he killed his father, right? So he runs far, far, far away. And he's living this Akuna Matata lifestyle. And Akuna Matata, it means no worries. He's just doing his thing, living his life, living it up. And many of you are in that Akuna Matata time of your life. It means no worries. I'm just having fun. I didn't even come here for that. I came here to fit that hammer in the nail thing. You know, you're just Akuna Matata. Well, what does it matter, right? But then one day Simba was going to wash his face. And when Simba went to wash his face, he would look to the water to wash his face. And all of a sudden he saw his father Mufasa's face in the water. He saw his father's reflection in him. And what happened when Simba saw his father's face in him is Simba said, I got to go back. Like all of a sudden when he was reminded of who he was, he was reminded of what he was called to do. And he realized, I have to go back to Pride Rock because there's an entire group of people waiting on me to get this revelation to go back and save them. And so Simba has this revelation and he goes all the way back. You remember the scene, you got uh, Timon and Pumbaa, everybody's running back to Pride Rock. And he gets to Pride Rock and he lets out this loud roar. And as soon as he roared, Scar, the enemy of this movie, turns around and he says, Mufasa? The enemy didn't even hear Simba. The enemy heard his father's voice through him. You see, that's what happens. When you get an image of who your God is in you, you are reminded, one, who you are, two, what you're called to do, and that there's an entire generation waiting on you to wake up to the fact that you understand and have the power living in you to raise people from the dead because of Jesus Christ. When you do that, all of a sudden, people don't see you. It doesn't matter what you do because they see Christ within you. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. 
Why do I do what I do? Why don't I do other things? Because this is all that matters. I had the opportunity to do that. I had the opportunity to build my platform, but I'm not interested in building my platform. It does nothing for anyone. I'm trying to build the kingdom. That's what changes the world. So you need to know who your God is. So I'm going to remind you of who your God is. I heard this message preached one time, and this lady laid it out so clearly. And I'm going to read you what she said over y'all. I have it basically memorized, but I have my translator friend who's going to read it to y'all who are listening so that you can hear every word. This is who your God is. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and he is the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and he is the manager of all time. He always was, always is, always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised but brought healing. He was pierced but eased pain. He was persecuted but brought freedom. He is risen to bring power and he reigns to bring peace. You remind yourself, friends, that he is light, he is love, he is longevity, and he is the Lord. He is goodness, he is kindness, he is faithfulness, and he is God. He is holy and righteous and powerful and pure. His ways are right, his word eternal, his will unchanging, and his mind is on you. He's our savior, our God, our Lord, our peace, our comfort, our joy, and he is the ruler of our life. He's the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ruler of all rulers, the ancient of days. His goal was a relationship with me. He'll never leave you, never forsake you, never mislead you, never forget you, never overlook you, and he will never cancel your appointment in his appointment book. When you fall, he will lift you up. When you fail, he will forgive you. When you are weak, he is strong. When you are lost, he is your way. When you are afraid, he is your courage. When you stumble, he will steady you. When you're hurt, he will heal you. When you're broken, he will mend you. When you're blind, he will lead you. When you're hungry, he will feed you. When you face trials, he is with you. When you face persecution, he will shield you. When we face problems, he will comfort us. When we face loss, he will provide for us. And when we face death, he will carry us home to meet him. He is everything for everyone every time and in every way. That is your God and that is who you belong to. That's powerful. So friends, that's who I'm talking about. That's who God is. That will shape everything about who you are and that will shape everything about what you do in life if that is true to you. So I want you to bow your head with me today and close your eyes. And I want you to have a moment to consider that. To consider what I'm saying, because this weekend's going fast. You're going to be on to the next thing in just a couple minutes, but I want you to have a moment, because when I was 17 years old and I had this moment, it changed my entire life, and that's why I'm here with y'all today. And maybe that's your moment right now. God, I just pray for every person right here in this space. I thank you that, God, who you are is becoming so clear to them right now. The revelation they're having right now will literally change them for the rest of their life. God, if they realize that you are God, that you sent your son to die a death on the cross for them, that saves them from eternal destruction that forgives them of all their sins. And not only that, but you sent the Holy Spirit to live with them every single day. I thank you for the power that your gospel holds. I thank you that that is the only way, the only truth, and the only life that we have to lean on. I thank you, God, for what you're doing. If they're ever asked the question that I was asked earlier, how do I believe it? How do I boldly say it? That they will refer back to this moment when it was undeniably true and real in their heart. Lord, would it never change? Would it never waver? Would they be on mission, sent out from this place to change culture, to be the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden? When people think of the country Norway, would they think about the revival that happened from these students getting a revelation of who you are. Because when we think about 2,000 years ago, we think about a cross. So it's not that crazy to think 
that our generation, even though we're lost and we're wicked and we're sinful, could be known as the church if the church wakes up. So God, help us to wake up. Thank you for what you're doing. If you're here tonight and that has become true to you, that God is God, he's the Lord of your life, if you were to say you are Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, God is the creator of the universe. If that's true to you tonight and you want to be found in that, I just ask that you would be bold enough to stand up. And stand up right now. It's awesome. Come on. It's awesome. So good. People standing in the back. There's people standing here. I'll say it one more time. I don't want you to miss your moment. If that's true to you tonight, let's not let fear stop this. Let's not let insecurity stop this. If God is God, Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, and you're going to live your life for him, that's the identity you find yourself in and the purpose that you have, then stand up. It's awesome. Come on. Come on, friends. That's awesome. Can we clap for that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Now I want you to look around at the person standing beside you. Surely they're your friend, and if not, say hello. And I want you to hold each other to that. Y'all are each other's people. Y'all are the church. Y'all are your community. You're the, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Y'all will be here tomorrow. I won't be here next year to hype you up. If I was, I'd hype you up all day long. But I won't be. Y'all are each other's hype squad. Y'all are each other's people who can hold this book and speak truth into your friend's life. Y'all are the people that will pray for each other. Y'all are the people that will be the light of the world together. So be that. Be that. I love you guys. I'm thankful that tonight I got to know you guys. I'm thankful tonight we got to share the word together. And I mean every word that I say. Hold on to this. Let that change who you are. And I have a feeling that in 10 years we'll look at even the impact made around you and none of it would have happened unless tonight happened. Everything happens for a reason. God is intentional and he is in all the details. And this moment in your life will be a marker of your life and you'll never be the same in the best way. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your conference.